Well, thanks, Lindsay, and thanks to everyone for joining today. I really appreciate you coming out to listen to me talk about my favorite topic, group policy. Um, a little bit about me before we get into it. Um, I do have, um, and I'm very proud to say I have a great, what I think is a great course up on the Pluralsight site called Group Policy Fundamentals. I spent the better half of last year sort of distilling the knowledge that I've gotten from spending time with group policy over the last 15, uh, forever it seems, 15 years of, uh, of working with Active Directory and group policy. And that went into that group policy fundamentals course where I try to cover everything from you know, basics around how group policy works to uh, towards the end things like best practices for design, um, group policy scripting, you name it, it tried to, I tried to put it into that course. So definitely check that out. If you have uh, Pluralsight access, get in there and, uh, and you, can, you can take that course. I also have a play-by-play. -play. Um, if you're not familiar with this, these are shorter um, uh, training sessions that, uh, that Pluralsight does. And I, I actually did this with uh, Gary Imerman over at Pluralsight, and he and I sat down and talked sort of interactively about best practices for group policy design, some of the challenges that you get into when you're deploying group policy or using group policy or have been using group policy for, for a long time. So uh, those two courses are out there. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been a group policy MVP through the Microsoft MVP program for 12 years now. Uh, it seems like a long time. And it's, group policy has changed over those years. Um, we've gotten lots of cool features, um, interesting uh, things have gone on with group policy. And uh, I actually I talk a little bit about sort of what I think the future of group policy is in that play-by-play. -play. So uh, um, it's always an interesting topic for me. Um, for those of you who are familiar with gpoguy.com, I founded that site back in 2004, and that's uh, kind of folded into another site that I have. Um, I actually in 2006 founded a company that not surprisingly does group policy uh, management products, and that's SDM Software. So the gpoguy.com and SDM Software site kind of meld together these days, and there's a bunch of freeware and FAQs and some uh, information, just general information about group policy out there. So definitely check that out. So what do I want to talk about today? You know, really the goal of group policy is to deliver configuration to systems. So whether it's security settings, whether it's user lockdown, or whether it's just configuring the user's environment, giving them drive mappings, printer mappings, whatever the case may be, that is really the goal of group policy. It's to configure your Windows servers, your Windows desktops, I work with a lot of customers that um, are using group policy to do security hardening of their Windows servers. You know, maybe they're using the free Microsoft tool, the Security Compliance Manager, or they've gotten group policy templates from NIST, or if you're a government agency, there's the government standards for you know, how to harden your Windows systems. All of that is relying on group policy for the most part to deliver those settings. You know, user lockdown, this is something that group policy has done for uh, actually since before it was group policy when it used to be called system policy, that, that ability to turn off elements within the Windows desktop, uh, you know, turn off the run dialog, turn off uh, task manager, turn off the command prompt, those kinds of user lockdowns uh, have been bread and butter for group policy since day one. And then the user environment stuff, which definitely took a step up when Microsoft introduced group policy preferences. Looks like I might have had a network issue. Um, hopefully you all can still see me. And um, so We can still see you, Darren. Uh, You're good. Okay, cool. I got a little message that popped up. I wanted to make sure I didn't drop off. So um, those are the those things are kind of bread and butter for group policy. And so you know, the reality of group policy, however, is, is often different from that goal. So the reality is you push, you, you, you push a button, and I sort of euphemistically say you push a button, you create settings, you, you link them in, in GPOs, and then what happens? You pray that they actually get there. So that this is the push and pray model of group policy. 
So, um, I, you know, I, I kind of release them into the universe and hope that they actually make it to their target systems. There's not a lot of feedback that you get from the group policy environment. So, um, as a result, you sort of hope that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting on those systems. And sometimes that um, doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, come to fruition. There's a lot of challenges. So when you're, you know, the typical workflow that folks go through, they create settings in group policy. They save those settings to a GPO. They commit them to the GPO. If it's a new GPO, then maybe you need to target that to a user or computer. Remember that it's users and computers that process group policy. Um, it, sometimes people get confused because the name, the word group is in the name group policy, but groups are not the targets of group policy. The things in Active Directory that get policy are user objects and computer objects. And that's a really key piece to keep in mind when you're trying to deliver settings. And it's, you know, when, I, when I'm helping folks that are just starting out with group policy, this is kind of the, the fundamental thing that they often miss is this notion of, you know, computers and users are the things that get group policy. Um, the user or computer receives those settings. So you link the GPO that you've created or you update the GPO that already exists. And at some indeterminate time in the future, the computer or the user receives those settings. Why do I say indeterminate? Well, let's look at the, the trigger points for group policy. So for the computer, the trigger points are that the computer starts up, and that, that's, a, uh, that, that, that's called foreground processing. And that um, startup will, will, will get uh, group policy processing for the computer. And then as the computer is running during the day, every 90 minutes plus this random 30-minute interval, group policy will refresh in the background for the computer. So again, you don't know once you, pu once you do the push of the group policy setting, you don't know exactly when the computer is going to receive it. Now for the user, it's similar. The user, when the user logs on, that's called the user's foreground processing cycle, and the user will process a bunch of settings. And then the same 90 minutes plus 30 minute random interval for the user, while the user is logged on to the computer, they'll be getting policy processing going on. So again, you're not, there's, no, uh, there's no moment in time uh, deployment of group policy. And this is especially true in large environments where you have thousands of users or computers across geographies, um, if, you, if you know anything about how group policy works, you make a setting on a domain controller and it replicates to all the other domain controllers. So group policy is not an instantaneous delivery. A client in, if I'm in uh, California and I make a change to my DC in California with a GPO setting, uh, that GPO has to replicate to, if I have a user in Japan, the DC, the, the user in Japan is going to use a domain controller in Japan if they're is one there to get policy. So my change from California has to replicate to, to Japan to get there. So people often think, well, I made a change to group policy. Why are all my users not getting it? There's this time that has to go, you know, pass before all of the changes have replicated to the clients. So there are uh, several common things that folks get hung up on when it comes to group policy. Uh, not the least of which is this notion that it's not instantaneous. So the first tip I want to share is around targeting. Again, group policy applies only to users and computers. Uh, again, this is, the, this is the, the key point to remember when you're processing policy. So what I'm showing you here is a, a picture of GP management or GP editor. And you know that, or if you don't know, then uh, the, there are two sides to a GPO. There's the computer configuration side and the user configuration side. The computer configuration side, as the name implies, is only read by computer objects. So if you have a bunch of settings in the computer configuration side, that GPO has to be linked to a container that contains computers. Now just to recall, you can link a GPO to an Active Directory site, to the domain as a whole, or to an OU containing computers. So uh, the key there is that you want the uh, GPOs that contain computer settings to be targeted at computer objects, and that's the key. 
Now, if you have user settings, similarly to computers, those need to be targeted to an OU that contains user objects. So um, the, the, the key piece here that I think a lot of folks get caught up on is they'll have a bunch of settings under computer configuration, and they sort of kind of sound like they should be user settings, but by virtue of the fact that they're in the computer configuration section of the GPO, you cannot link those to an OU containing a bunch of user objects and expect them to be processed. It just won't happen. So if you get this fundamental point about targeting, you will save yourself a lot of grief. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the tools you can use to sort of help yourself know whether you're targeting correctly or not. Whenever I help people, um, that's usually the place I start. My, uh, I'm not getting settings. Well, it may be because uh, this targeting is just being done incorrectly. So that's a great starting point. The other point I'll make here, and that you saw my animation kind of pop up these two little uh, um, security groups is that you can do filtering of group policy settings based on security groups or something that we call WMI filters. Security groups basically say, okay, I have this computer setting that I'm applying to this client's OU and all the computers in it, except I only want it to really apply to these five computers over in this OU and not all 100 of them. So if I put those five computers in a security group, and set the permissions on the GPO to only have that security group be the ones that process the policy, then I'm able to tune down who gets the policy settings. That is the role of security groups or WMI filters. WMI filters are just a way of doing that for things like hardware criteria. Only install this on Windows 7 machines or only install this on Server 2012 R2 machines. That's the goal of that security filtering or the WMI filtering. So again, groups are involved, but groups are only involved to filter. They're not involved for targeting purposes. If I had this GPO here and I had an OU down below people that contained only group objects, if I linked this GPO to that OU containing only group objects, nothing would happen. There would be no processing of that policy. So that's a key piece to understand. So some of the common targeting mistakes, linking GPOs with per computer settings to OUs that only contain user objects or vice versa. This is um, classic starting, uh, you know, beginner mistake when it comes to group policy targeting. Linking GPOs to OUs that only contain groups, like I said, computer or user objects are where it's at. Now if you're linking a GPO to the domain, well, the domain is everything, right? It's computer objects, it's user objects, it's groups, it's contacts, it's whatever, whatever is in your Active Directory. So you're bound to hit something. What is it they say? Even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. If you link GPOs to the domain, uh, they will, something will process them eventually. And, and you'll note in my, both in my course and in my play-by-play -play that I did, I talk about the the, the situations where you want to use domain linking, and they tend to be very limited. I don't like linking GPOs at the domain level if I can avoid it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation. Um, loopback policy. This is a special mode of group policy processing that, that changes the way user policy is applied, and people get tripped up with this a lot. Loopback policy, when you enable a computer for loopback, you're saying to any user that comes along and logs onto that computer, hey user, I don't care what OU you're in and what policy you normally get as a user, when you log on to this system, I want you to get this special policy, this special user policy. And that can confuse things. The, the use case for loopback is primarily things like kiosk systems or uh, remote desktop servers, Zen desktop, Zen app types of systems where you're, you're having a multi-user environment where users are logging on to either a shared system or it's a special system where you want it to be completely controlled. That is a different situation and can cause confusion if you've got loopback enabled on a computer. So, um, I bring that up not to say that it's a common mistake, but it is a mistake I see out there where you're not getting the expected user policy on a system, 
and it turns out that somebody has enabled loopback on that computer. You're forgetting about filtering when you're trying to troubleshoot or trying to target policy. You might have a security group defined on the GPO, or you might have WMI filters defined on the GPO, and you're wondering why the user or computer is not getting those settings. Um, and I'll go in and, and show you some of this in the UI when we get down to that. Tip number two, keep it simple. Uh, this seems like it's kind of an obvious one, but it, it trips a lot of people up as they get more into group policy. A lot of the confusion is, is around who is being, what is being targeted to whom. And this is a little different than my targeting tip. This is saying that as environments grow up and you get lots of group policy objects and you get lots of settings, you sort of lose track of what's going on. And this happens especially if you don't have good kind of rigorous standards around where you link GPOs and where you apply settings. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Again, group policy comes with, out of the box, thousands of knobs and switches. It absolutely doesn't mean you have to use them. In fact, I just, like a month ago, wrote a blog, part, a blog article on my SDM software site called um, How Much Lockdown is Too Much Lockdown? You know, and, and in the years that I've been doing group policy, I've sort of evolved in how I think about this. So in the beginning, all of those flashing knobs and switches are very alluring. Ooh, I can turn this off and I can turn that off. And what you find is the user experience is degraded. And so you get these thousands of settings and you have this sort of desire to turn them on because they're there, and you run into situations with unintended consequences. So you turn off some UI element in the Explorer shell and it causes some application to not function properly. Uh, I spent hours and hours in the early days of my use of group policy troubleshooting these kinds of issues. So just because group policy has thousands of settings doesn't mean you have to use them. Think back to my three goals around group policy, security, user lockdown, and user experience. What ends up happening from my perspective is that security is the most important thing you can do. The second most important thing is user experience or user you know, configuring the user's environment, mappings of drives or printers to, get them, to let them do their job. The third is lockdown. Do I really need to remove the run command from the start menu? Do I really need to remove the, sh the command prompt? If the user is not an administrator on their workstation, which is a whole different story, then the operating system's own security will protect them from doing a lot of really silly things. Um, if the user is an administrator on their workstation, then, um, then I will admonish you that <laughs> that's not a good thing. Um, that as an administrator, a user can, and, and thereby extension, a bad guy can do anything on that, use, on that computer as the user. So that's a different whole discussion around kind of least privilege and managing you know, administrative access. But the point here is that group policy is very powerful. It doesn't mean you have to use all that power up front. So here's some tips that I throw out hey, in my course. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Could I get you to minimize your Skype line on your screen? Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, no worries. Ends up being, Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so here are some tips. I've got nine tips here that I'm going to go through. Link GPOs as close to their intended targets as possible. What does that mean? It means that, going back to what I said about domain links, don't link all your GPOs at the domain level. If you have an OU that contains uh, a set of computers and you want to lock down those computers, link at, on that OU. Don't link at the domain level. And then rely on, like for example, security filtering to, to squinch down what you want to apply that GPO to. I apply this logic even if I have multiple OUs Let's say I have 10, 10 top-level OUs in my Active Directory domain, and I only want a GPO to apply to five of them. I would rather link that single GPO to those five OUs individually than link it at the domain level and have to rely on security group filtering to control whether that GPO is applying to those five OUs. 
And this is because there's a couple reasons for this, but one is the more stuff that's linked to the domain, the harder it is to overcome that downstream if you need to. And if you're relying on domain link GPOs that are security group filtered, if somebody makes a mistake in that security group filtering, for example, they add the wrong group or they accidentally remove the security group filtering or they add authenticated users, you're suddenly exposing the entire domain to that GPO and what it does. And I've seen entire environments, users locked out of the environment because somebody had a domain link GPO where they fat fingered the security group filtering and it suddenly applied to everyone. Use filtering like security groups, WMI, or this feature in GP preferences called item level targeting. Use that on an exception basis. Don't rely on that for delivering settings, but use it when you need to use it. So these two go together. Link as close to the target and use filtering as on an exception. Part of this goes to how you've organized your AD. I know a lot of companies that have a flat meaning a single OU where all user accounts are held. This makes it really hard to differentiate user settings based on, for example, an OU structure. Like you might have users in the marketing department, users in the engineering department, but if they're all in a single OU, then you have to rely on security group filtering for that. And that obviously it puts a little bit more work on you as the group policy administrator. Limit the fingers in the pie. So what I mean by that is don't give everyone and their brother the ability to create, edit, and link GPOs. There's a fairly good delegation model in group policy. Use it religiously to keep the right small subset of administrators with access to group policy. Avoid the one setting, one GPO model. So there are definitely valid reasons why you would want to create a setting and give it its own GPO. Maybe it's a, some new vulnerability has come out and there's a group policy setting you can set in order to uh, mitigate it. Go for it. You know, create the GPO, put the setting in it, give it a name that's descriptive of what the GPO is doing. That's fine. But if you get into this model of always deploying a new GPO whenever you have a new setting that you want, you're going to have a lot of GPOs. I like to group settings by function, desktop lockdown settings, uh, server hardening settings. And you might have different policies from different areas in those single GPOs, but it's a nice functional-based approach. And I think that can help in sort of balancing you know, having a ton of GPOs versus giving you the granularity of delegation that you want for a particular GPO. Avoid this copy and paste phenomenon. I've got GPO A. It's got a bunch of settings that I, that I really want to use over here, but um, there's a few I want to tweak. So I'm going to copy it and paste it, which GPMC allows you to do. And then I've got all these redundant settings and I just tweak a few of them. And I link it into the same hierarchy that the first one that I copied from is linked into. And now I've got users processing the same settings two and three times. That's not a great thing. So if you can avoid the copy and paste approach, I always recommend, you know, it's even, even if you have to recreate the GPOs manually um, or copy and paste and then take out the settings you don't need. I think that's better than just assuming that, oh, it's no big deal. I'm just going to have you know, five GPOs that look mostly the same being processed by this one user, but then there's a few settings that are different. Group settings for performance. I go into this in a lot more detail in my course. There is this uh, notion that certain group policy areas require a synchronous foreground processing cycle. What does that mean? Let's take software installation as an example. Software installation is where you can deploy software packages to computers and users. Software installation requires a, what's called a synchronous foreground processing cycle. So let's say you deploy a package to a computer. In the background, the computer is going to detect that it needs that package. It's going to set a flag that says, hey, the next read computer needs to be synchronous. When the machine reboots, 
what happens is synchronous processing says wait until all group policy processing is finished before I present the logon dialog to the user. Great, so now that's synchronous. The software has installed. All life is good. If I have, let's say I have a GPO that has um, software installation policy and admin template policy in it. Now, group policy is smart, but it's not that smart. If I make a change to that GPO's admin template setting, it doesn't know which policy area changed. It just knows something in that GPO has changed. So during the next background processing cycle, it's going to say, oh, that GPO has changed, and I see it has software installation in it. So I'm going to make the next foreground processing cycle synchronous. And suddenly you've artificially slowed down the boot process for that machine because it happens to have a software installation GPO in it. So if you keep those four, three or four policy areas, GPP, drive mapping, folder redirection, software installation, separate in their own GPOs from admin templates or security or any of the other policy areas, you'll prevent that from happening. The always wait for network at computer startup and user logon policy. This is the, uh, the ultimate catch-all for troubleshooting. I, I see this come up on forums all the time. Somebody says, oh, policy isn't processing. I don't know why. Um, somebody else responds, have you turned on always wait for network at policy processing and startup, at, user, at machine startup and user logon? What does that do? All that that does is it says, always use synchronous GP processing all the time for both computer and user. What synchronous processing means, again, is wait till GP processing is completely finished before presenting the logon dialog. When the user logs on, wait for GP processing for the user to completely finish before you present the user their desktop. This elongates policy process, or I'm sorry, elongates the boot and the startup time for the user and the logon time for the user. It very rarely solves the underlying problem. Sometimes it seems like it does, but often what I've seen is there are different problems. So I, I used to recommend this in the XP days. I used to recommend this policy. I would say it's not really going to buy you much, and it's going to definitely slow down your user experience. So I think you have to balance using this. Again, it's not doing anything magic that's suddenly making group policy work. It's just telling group policy to finish what it's doing before it gets to the next step. And this one doesn't have anything to do with deployment. It has more to do with keeping your sanity. GPMC provides the facility to back up your group policy objects. Go in today if you haven't done this already. Back up all your GPOs. There's a, if you right-click on the Group Policy Objects container in GPMC, it lets you back up all your GPOs. You can do it in one shot. Whenever you make a change to a GPO, back it up before you edit it. This gives you the back out that you need, that you'll want um, when something goes wrong. Okay, tip number three, leverage result and set of policy. This is a great feature that Microsoft added in XP days. Um, result and set of policy does two things. Result and set of policy modeling tells you what policies should be delivered to a given user or computer. So it's modeling what you should get. Result and set of policy results or logging tells you what the policy settings that were delivered to a given user or computer. Both of these tools are the first thing I tell somebody to do or uh, Let's put it this way, group policy results or logging is the first thing I will tell someone to do if they say, I'm not getting the settings that I, that I expected to have. The first two tips that I gave you, you know, know, understand targeting and know what you're delivering to those two systems, both of those are helped by using RSOB. And they are the best line of defense on what should happen before you deploy a policy and what did happen. So from GPMC, you can do group policy modeling and group policy results. I personally prefer doing it in GPMC because the GUI is very intuitive to look at. I know a lot of folks that like the command line. GP result is a command line tool that's in every version of Windows these days. It does RSOP from the command line. It exports it out to text. 
There's also an option to export it out to an HTML file, which is essentially equivalent to the GUI. But you know, if I'm doing it, I'm typically doing it in GPMC. PowerShell, if you're a PowerShell fan like me, there's a get GP result instead of policy commandlet in the group policy PowerShell module that Microsoft provides. It will deliver that data as well, and it will send it out to an HTML file. So what I wanted to do with the few minutes remaining before we take questions is I wanted to just kind of walk through this with you in GPMC. So bear with me while I get my test environment up, and hopefully you can all see that. I've got a domain here. You'll see that I've got group policy modeling and group policy results nodes in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start the group policy modeling wizard. The way group policy modeling works is it runs against a domain controller in your domain. So it uses a service running on domain controllers to do the modeling. So you can tell it to use any domain controller running Server 2003 or greater, or you can use a specific one. Then what it lets you do is it lets you model a particular user or computer or a container, a container being like an OU. So for example, I could ask the question, you know, what, is the, what are the settings that are going to apply to the engineering OU? Similarly for the computer, I have an, an engineering OU called workstations. What are the settings that are going to apply to computers on that OU? I can then do some interesting things. I can simulate a slow network connection, meaning group policy behavior changes when it detects a slow network between the client and the DC, so I can simulate that. I can simulate that loopback processing that I talked about to show how the settings will change. And I can simulate moving a computer from a, for the site it's in to a different site. So let's say I wanted to know how the settings will change if I'm in the California site. I can also change group membership for the computer and the user because remember, group policy can be filtered based on groups. So I can add groups. Let's say I wanted to know what happens if I add the user to a marketing users group. So if I type marketing back here. Sorry, my, my keyboard is slow. Oh, I know. I have a, there's a bug in this that doesn't let me backspace. That's what's going on here. So I've got marketing users. So what I'm saying is I want to simulate adding the user who's in the engineering OU to the marketing users group. And I could do the same for computers. I'll leave it alone. I could add WMI filters to the mix. So I can say what's going to happen if I add a WMI filter. And then I run the simulation. And what it does is it shows me a summary of the GPOs that will be processed by the computer or the user. It shows me component status, which are the policy areas that will be processed. And then it shows me, most interestingly, the settings that will be applied computer and user. The thing that you cannot do with modeling is you cannot say, what will the settings be if I add this new GPO to the engineering OU? It doesn't let me add links, you know, new GPOs. It only takes what's existing. So for example, in the engineering OU, I've got some existing GPOs linked to these different levels. It only takes what's there. It doesn't take what might be there. And that's the one limitation in the modeling feature. But it does let me do the parameters like slow link and loop back and security groups and WMI filters, so it lets me change a little bit. So I always recommend using a modeling run before you do a thing. Maybe, maybe you're going to make a change to a, um, uh, a security group filter or something like that. You can, you can basically see what the impact of that might be. Group policy results, the other side of this equation, lets me see what has happened on the target system. So for example, if I right click the group policy results wizard, and I say I want to go see what same backspace issue. Let me just browse. I'm going to type in the name of a computer. 
yes, I like wine. I have this wine, wine named computers. So Cabernet, and I want to see what happens for this user, Darren, in that domain. And what this is doing now is it's going out over WMI and collecting RSOP data directly from that computer Cabernet and telling me what happened on that computer. And again, it gives me for computer and user the applied GPOs. If I have denied GPOs, it tells me the reason they were denied. So you'll see here I have disabled link. This one is empty, so it didn't do any work. This one is inaccessible, meaning I have a uh, security group filtering on that GPO that prevents me from reading it and applying it. Uh, this one's a disabled GPO, and this one has a false WMI filter. In other words, the WMI filter that was on this GPO was not passed by my computer. So I can get that data for computer or user. Component status, that will tell me whether each of the policy areas that were run on this uh, for this computer were successful in running. So I can troubleshoot problems that may have cropped up in GP processing. And then finally, I can go here and get settings detail for the computer and user. Show me what settings have been processed by this computer and which GPO, in this case the winning GPO, delivered those settings. Really useful information for determining targeting, for determining if I'm getting the right settings, and determine which GPO is delivering me the settings that I'm getting. So all of that can be super helpful when it comes to figuring out, you know, am I getting group policy delivery the way I expect? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and ask if there's actually any questions. And it looks like there might be a few questions here. What is the typical software packaging solution that is used outside of SCCM? Um, in so I, I'm going to sort of infer uh, – uh, okay, so there's a follow-up question here that says, can you recommend a GPO packaging software for SMB? When you talk about packaging, I'm assuming you're talking about how, you know, what, what do you use to create um, – uh, uh, an, like an example, an, a setup, an MSI package. Um, I'm going to differentiate that from, you know, how to, what are the alternatives for delivering software installation. Um, so let me start. Let me, actually, let me answer both of those. So for packaging, um, you know, I haven't kept up with this. I know there are some free solutions out there. Um, there's a there's a Microsoft tool called Orca that is a very rough tool. There is a version of that, a commercial version of that, that allows you to create MSI packages. And I don't recall the name of it, but if you search on Orca, I think you'll find – it's got Orca in the name, and I think you'll find that tool. Um, there are some uh, – I, I know that, for example, the script logic folks who are now part of Dell had a software packaging utility that allowed you to create setups. Um, in terms of deploying software packages, I, I do want to mention that you know, Group Policy has this basic software installation capability that supports deploying MSIs. Um, if you're in a small environment and you don't have a lot of heavy requirements, um, that can be certainly one of those for uh, one of the options for deploying software. Um, there's a company called SpecOps Software that has a really cool, I consider it to be software installation, group policy software installation on steroids. It's a really cool way of uh, augmenting the deployment feature within group policy uh, with, a, with a really capable software installation mechanism using group policy. So um, this is uh, these are two different ways of approaching the problem. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, let's see. Is there a good way to deploy software to users who are power users on the PC? Um, so I, I think there's, there, maybe there's a question implied in here, which is that um, you know, Power users have the ability to deploy, to do install software themselves, but not complete ability. 
in the case of like for example group policy software installation, you can do a per user or per computer uh, deployment. And when the software gets installed, it actually runs elevated by default. So, micro, so group policy elevates the installation even if it's running as the user just to get the installation done. So even if the user didn't have um, if the user didn't have a, uh, sufficient rights to install the software, group policy will elevate them to give them that access. So you know, that I think is, if you're talking about group policy, that's the best way to handle that. Um, uh, you know, I, I always tell people to not rely on the user and the user's privileges to install software if at all possible. Because if they can install legitimate software, that means they can also install not so legitimate software. Um, sometimes logging time is so slow that in that case, is there a way to check which policy it slows down? Um, yeah, so if you have a newer version of the Group Policy Management Console, one running on Windows 8 or Server 2012 R2, there is now timings that get put into the Group Policy Results uh, dialog. And the timings give you the ability to, um, uh, to actually see where time is being spent in group policy processing. So if the slowdown is a result of group policy, then, uh, then that can actually uh, point the way um, sometimes in terms of you know, whether group policy is responsible for it or not. Um, I also have on the SDM software or gpoguy.com website, under our freeware, there's a um, free tool, and actually let me just bring up, just going to share my deck for just a quick second because I do have a couple more slides that I want to talk about. Um, let's just, here, just bear with me for just a second. And let me just share this. And I'll get back to questions in a second, but I just I want to make sure I get this before the end of the time. Uh, so just to summarize, group policy is complex. Uh, settings can often be that push and pray thing I talked about, and to avoid that, clear on targeting, simple deployments, and leverage the RSOP tools. What I wanted to get to was this second bullet, this group policy health reporter, is a freeware tool I have on my site that can actually do uh, GP timing measurement as well. So you can go in time, uh, it'll tell you exactly what, how long it took to process policy. Um, so that's the point I wanted to make. Um, the other two points here, uh, definitely check out my course. And you know, in terms of like products for doing kind of compliance across the environment, we have our policy compliance manager product. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. I do want to get back to the questions. So let me uh, stop sharing and get back to questions. I wanted to make those points so that folks got them before the end. Um, what was the name of the application again for MSI packaging? It, it, Orca, Orca is the keyword that I was mentioning, O-R-C-K, like, or, um, o -R -C -A, like the, the, uh, the killer whale. Um, if you do a search on that, I think you'll find the tool that I'm thinking about. Uh, let's see, what would be the best practices to have one GPO override a specific setting or multiple settings that is being deployed by another GPO? Right, so um, typically the way this uh, works what I try to avoid is there's a flag that you can put on a link called um, the enforced flag. And the enforced flag will prevent, uh, if you have like a GPO linked at the domain level, and you want that setting to apply regardless of what somebody does downstream, you set the enforced flag on that link. And anyone that puts in a conflicting setting down at an OU level, that conflicting setting will not apply. So that is one way to, to, to handle that. I try to avoid doing too many enforced GPOs, especially at the domain level, because it does remove your options. But sometimes, for example, for security settings, that's the way to do it. Um, there's also a hierarchy for a given OU. There, if you have multiple GPOs linked on an OU, there's a hierarchy or a priority that you can control in GPMC. So if you have, let's say you have five GPOs and two of them contain 
conflicting settings and you want one of them to always win, you move it up to the top position or at least above the one that has the conflicting setting, and that one will always be processed last, and that one will win. So the, the way GP handles conflict is really simple. Last writer wins. So um, the, the, uh, th th that kind of approach is gets, starts making things complicated, but you can play with the hierarchy to do that. Um, I try to avoid as much as possible doing, having, having conflicts, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And so using hierarchy, using the enforced flag um, can sometimes help with that. The other thing I'll say is if you have a GPO that you need to always, poss always absolutely win and you're going to use the enforced flag, then um, I, you know, try to make it so that, that that setting or settings that you want to enforce are the only things in that GPO. In other words, don't put enforced on a GPO that has 100 settings unless you really want 100 settings to be enforced. Um, here's a question. Is there a better way to block settings from a certain workstation? Currently, I deny access to the GPO via advanced settings. Right. So if you have, this is a scenario I painted earlier, if you have 100 computers in a OU and you only want uh, 90 of them to get the setting, you can either use security group filtering to allow those 90, or you can use security group filtering to deny the 10. Those are your two options essentially. And is one better than the other? Well, um, it, you know, using security group filtering implies that you are really good about ensuring that um, the, uh, you, you're adding the, the computers that you want into the security group. So assuming that's the case, I prefer the allow approach because allows are obvious in the UI, whereas denies as you pointed out, are embedded under the advanced dialog. And even the GPMC delegation tab doesn't show explicitly that you have a deny on there. So it can lead to confusion. But a deny is a legitimate approach if, the, uh, if, if you're not rely, if you, if you don't want to have to rely on security group membership for the allows. So hopefully that makes sense. It's hard to describe in, on the phone, but my, my point being if you aren't going to be copious about making sure that all the right machines are always in the allow group, then a deny is a perfectly legitimate approach. Let's see, on some computer, uh, on some computer configuration admin templates, some templates under system have more options than others. How can I get the system administrative template from one domain to be copied, for lack of a better term, to another domain or several domains for that matter? Um, not sure I follow this. So what you see in admin templates in the GP editor is strictly a function of the underlying ADMX files that are being used in that domain. So uh, the, the UI is built dynamically based on the ADMX files, or if you're still using ADM files, those as well. So if you see options in one environment that don't exist in another, it could be because you have different ADMX files underlying those. And I actually just did a blog posting about this again on my SDM software site where I talk about um, you know, ADMX, uh, how ADMX plays a role in GP editing. It does not play any role in GP processing. It's only relevant for GP editing. Um, and uh, I think that's an important distinction to make, and some people get confused around that. But I suspect what you're seeing is a difference between the excuse me, the ADM or ADMX files that you have in each of those environments. Is there an easy way to perform group policy cleanup? I would like to compare policies and identify duplicate settings that are being applied. Example, I have three policies that are heavily modified for workstation servers and laptops. I would like to strip the common settings into a single and make a workstation server laptop more unique to the device. Yeah, this is a question that um, me as my, if I put on my SDM software hat that we get a lot, um, there's different ways to approach this. So we actually have commercial products that you know, GPO Compare and GPO Exporter that are specifically designed for that. That's what people come to us for. If you're not in the commercial product world, um, what I have found the best way to approach that is to use the PowerShell commandlets to generate GPMC settings reports in XML and then parse the XML to find where those similarities are. 
Um, otherwise, what you're talking about is taking uh, HTML settings reports from GPMC and manually putting those into spreadsheets and comparing those visually. So um, you know, it depends on how many GPOs you have. That may be a perfectly reasonable approach. Um, you know, we work often with customers that have like hundreds or thousands of GPOs, and so that's not tenable for them. But there's absolutely free ways to do it with the HTML settings reports with PowerShell. Uh, you just need to kind of spend a little bit of time with it. Uh, regarding targeting, if I understand correctly, each GPO will only apply to either computer objects or user objects. That is correct. You can't have a GPO that does both unless the objects are in the same container where the GPO is being applied. Absolutely correct. That is absolutely the case. So you can have a GPO that contains both computer and user settings. Um, well, let me, let me qualify my answer. Let's say you have a GPO that has both computer and user settings. You can link that single GPO to multiple OUs. So let's say you link it to an engineering workstations OU that contains computer objects. Well, those computer objects will process the computer part of that GPO. You can link that same GPO to an OU that contains engineering user objects, and it will, only the user objects will, will, um, will process the user settings. I typically recommend against that. I recommend you know, basically having GPOs that contain only user settings or only computer settings because it gets, in, it gets easier from a targeting perspective and less confusing visually when you're doing that. But it is absolutely legitimate to have uh, you know, what the scenario I just described. Is there a reason to limit the number of OU blocks non-enforced GPOs? Um, not so I, I'm assuming, so there's this notion of block inheritance. You can set a block inheritance flag on two, and what that is, it, it, it upstream GPOs from being processed um, unless there's an enforced flag on one of those upstream links. Um, you know, where I find block inheritance useful is in scenarios where I have a test, a test OU or an OU that specifically needs to be uh, excluded from higher level policy for business reasons or you know, maybe it's a spe special environment and I don't want it to have the regular GPOs that everyone gets. But you have to be really cautious about that because if you have domain link GPOs for security, the, you know, corporate security set across the entire environment, the last thing you want is somebody coming in below you and saying, oh, nope, I'm blocking that because I want to do whatever I want to do. This gets back to limiting fingers in the pie, right? You want to make sure you know who's creating and linking GPOs downstream from you. If you're setting domain linked policy, you've got to make sure you know who's doing what downstream. So, you know, it's a trade off. Block inheritance has its place, but don't grant it to everyone and their brother. And the ability to set block inheritance is a property on the OU. It's a permission on the OU. It's not a permission on GPOs. So that's something to keep in mind when you're in GPMC. If you go into, if you select an OU and click the delegation tab, you can control who can set options on that OU. I think I've gotten all of the questions and we're down to the wire here. So I really appreciate everyone that stayed on. I hope I I uh, was able to answer most of the questions, and sorry again for the technical glitch uh, in the middle there, but hopefully this was useful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, that's right with all the questions um, that have come through and all the time that we have for today. If you have additional comments, questions, or feedback, you can email us at webinars at pluralsite.com. Again, we did record the webinar, and we'll email the link out in a few days. Remember to tweet about your experience today and continue the conversation with hashtag PluralSiteLive for a chance to win a free month's training. And remember, as you leave, please fill out our survey. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Um.